we as bands with following, we really need to talk about it every day because we see that like uh, Ukraine is disappearing from headlines, you know, gradually because again, everybody is tired of this war. But the war is still going on and we have quite a lot of occupied territories where Russians are committing horrible things. And I mean, after deoccupying the Kiev region, I'm sure that the entire world has already seen what they're capable of. That's why, like, we've seen that Ukrainian soldiers, Ukrainian army are able to fight on their own, but we really need to get all the necessary weapons for them. Because if you take a look at the map, Russia is many times more than Ukraine. And in terms of weapons, it's like the situation is the same. Therefore, I would like to ask uh, your readers um, not to forget about this war. It doesn't mean that you have to stay focused on it every day because even we are living our lives every day, you know? But just take, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes a day to check up on this, maybe to share a post about a news about what's happening there. If you have a chance, please donate um, to official uh, foundations that are raising funds for Ukrainian needs. And of course, support Ukrainian metal scene, uh, because even by listening to a song or an album, it already helps us, uh, you know, to raise awareness about the bands. And we also get, you know, some small royalties that will also help us to help um, the country. Let's start, of course, with the quite new song, Magura's Last Kiss. If you could tell us a bit of uh, background of the song and the myths behind it. Mm -hmm. The thing is, this song is not a new song. We released it before, but, you know, nowadays, if you release anything without a video, it's not, you know, so much spread and accepted. Basically, we released it last year uh, within a EP about Ukrainian mythological creatures. And basically, Magura is a Ukrainian Valkyrie um, and the daughter of Perun. And um, yeah, so according to mythology, she um, she encourages the warriors to fight. And when they die on the battlefield bravely, she covers uh, them with her wings, uh, gives them to drink like the holy water and they go to Vudi, which is a Ukrainian paradise. And when we were writing this song, it was written in 2020. You know, it was absolutely just related to the mythology. And I was just, I decided, you know, to imagine that this Magura is fed up with wars. So basically, like in this song, she stops the wars. We filmed the video for this song at the end of last year. And we received it like the video was finished like two days before the full scale war in Ukraine started. And for several months, we really didn't know whether we should release it or not. And in the end, we decided that we should. And we dedicated this video to uh, all, all defenders of Ukraine. When you were making the video, what kind of uh, ideas were behind it? You know, we just, um, there wasn't like a lot of ideas. We just uh, had some lines in the lyrics of this song. And that's why, for example, I already imagined how Magura would look like. So it corresponds to the, to the lyrics. And we also worked uh, with a designer and with a great production team. So basically it was just, you know, a music video. But uh, you can already see that, for example, the warriors that you see in the video, they have like these traditional ornaments used in Ukrainian traditional clothing, you know. So we have like these embroidered shirts that are, that are called vishvankas and like small pieces of it are placed like on the warriors, you know, outfits, so to say. And I also know that, for example, we decided for the warriors not to use traditional weapons. So basically they use like agricultural instruments or something like this. And um, there is also, for example, 
like this hammer and how do you call it? I mean, the the symbols of the USSR and you can see like how they are falling in the video, but it was really not intentional. And to some extent, like this song and this video, they were like, like a prophecy of what was going to happen. It's really insane, you know? Yeah, you have been staying very, very active as a band, but how is it to plan future for the for your band at the moment in the current situation? Uh, you know, um, we went through a lot of stages over the past three months or so, because at the beginning, like we couldn't even listen to music, like not to mention like playing shows and uh, our band is situated in Kiev. So when Kiev was occupied, like it was all about survive, not like the Kiev region was occupied and it was really unsafe. And we just, we just were thinking about our safety and survival. Then, um, like everyone started finding their place in this war. One of the things that we were doing from the beginning is like informational things. So we were, because we have a large audience abroad, and like our audience is mostly abroad. So we decided that we would spread truth about the war. So we posted daily updates on our Patreon about it in a publicly available post. Then uh, we decided that we could raise more funds, you know, from selling merch. So we released like more merch items and finally our postal services started working. So we started with this. Then we played like these charity shows. At this point, like uh, we couldn't play the shows that were booked for us in Finland, for example, in Norway, because um at this moment and since the beginning of war all men uh, aged from 18 to 60 are not allowed to leave the country because we have like this general mobilization but at this point um our ministry of culture can give you as a band a recommendation for you to leave the country to play some shows so you you cannot, you know, just go and not return, but you can leave, for example, for a week to play the shows and then get back. It's a very complicated process to get this approval. And at this point, we have some shows planned for this August, um, some festivals, you know, and some of them are being booked in Europe. And at the same time, we're gathering all the documents, all the invitations from festivals and everything to get this approval. We just, you know, we cannot even know that we survive until August because, again, a missile can hit the house at any time. But we're doing everything that we can. And we also are trying to book a tour with club shows for September. So these are our plans for this moment, because, again, our intention is to continue our career, because, again, um, this is how we can also help our country by bringing money, you know, here, donating, because we do it every day and the entire country does it every day. And also raising awareness about the war, because we understand that everybody is tired of this, especially in Europe, especially on festivals after several years of Corona. So we just feel that we need to do it and we really want to do it. And as for the album, we were planning to release a new album this year together with Napalm Records, but we decided to postpone it until the next year. Well, I can give, I cannot give any more details, but this is just how it goes, you know. You mentioned the song was uh, released in the Bestia split with Ersedu. Uh, how did this uh, collaboration or collaborations with Ersedu begin? Uh, we've been friends for more than 10 years uh, and they are also musicians and we really have a very similar approach to writing music and we like similar genres and every year we just visit them and during the pandemic we also did it and we just decided while we cannot you know produce another full-length album because it takes a longer time it could be a great time for a collaboration because everybody was sitting at home. And this is how it actually started. So, yeah. 
I think it was it was a good idea and it's a, like a small album but there is no there are no filler songs you know you just all five songs have their place and this is what I like about it uh, I saw on your social media this uh, post of this uh, festival called uh, Fine Misto that uh, sounds very interesting could me tell you a bit about the festival and well your experience with it Well, Finally Misto is actually a yearly festival in Ukraine. And um, I, ca- I always say that this is like the closest that you can get to a, you know, really European festival because it has usually several days, many stages. It has a very cool organization and we really love this festival. We should have played on this festival this summer as well, but for obvious reasons, uh, I think it's going to be postponed. But from the very start of the full-scale war, this festival um, raises funds for some special regiments of Ukrainian army. And uh, yeah, basically when it became more or less safe to play, you know, so to say, shows. So it's not a festival. Is just a show that is happening underground in a bomb shelter because every day we still have air raids. And basically, like it was lasting three days, and there were different bands, and everybody were playing for free just to raise funds, you know, again for this regiment. And it went really well, and we did it actually two times: one time in Lviv, another time in Ternopil. So it was really good to play. Um, live shows in front of people finally yeah but you know it's it's a complicated thing because you are playing in the country the air raids are happening at the same time and in another part of your country the territories are occupied so it's really surreal but all the bands we just understand that this is our way to fight you know so if we can do it then be it you know well we've been uh talking about collaborations and uh, festivals too uh what's your view on the ukrainian metal scene in the 2020s from like your point of view of current situation excluded of course um it's interesting because over the past years ukrainian bands finally started you know getting a spotlight and also touring because actually um i guess six or seven maybe eight years ago something like this like before we had to get a visa to travel to the European Union and it it was always um, a complication for Ukrainian bands to tour because for example you need to get a visa for six people and maybe one person is not allowed for any reasons you know it's also it always costs a lot of money and it's it was really complicated When we got this visa-free regime, it became became easier. And the more Ukrainian bands started touring, the more like information we got about how it works, you know. And also like we see that labels finally started seeing Ukrainian bands live. And of course, they started signing these bands. And, you know, it's just a natural development that we couldn't get before. And also, if you take Ukraine, for example, it's a huge country. And we being in Kiev, we need at least one day to get to the border to travel further, you know. So for us, just going to place two shows in the middle of Europe, it takes one week, you know, just to get back and forth. So it's uh, we really face more complications the normal European bands do. Uh, but I'm really glad that we started, you know, started developing. And it's really a pity that such thing as a horrible war stopped it all. Although we also understand that nowadays, because of the war, people are discovering Ukrainian bands more because like we are getting more attention, of course, So it's like, um, it's a complicated question. And uh, I can also say that in Ukraine, metal is underground music. So 
you don't really have like uh, huge metal festivals here or i don't know uh, metal bands don't usually gather a lot of crowds so but we have like other genres of music that are really popular and they are very high quality and i'm really okay with that because for example i also know that let's say in italy there are more uh italian metal bands than italian metal fans whereas for example in spain there are there is a huge metal community but there are not so many active and famous spanish metal bands you know so it really doesn't matter as long as you have like internet and ability to travel abroad 